Slums were desperate places to live, by any name, but to find yourself living in one called Murder Bay surely attracted its own kind of dread. Found in the area of modern-day Washington, D.C.'s triangle of streets comprising Pennsylvania Avenue, Constitution Avenue, and 15th Street, this was an infamous hive of destitution and debauchery in the mid-1800s, where gambling flourished and murder was frequent. And all this literally a stone's throw away from the White House, within sight and sound of the President himself. If you think Murder Bay sounds like a rough name, how about Hell's Bottom in the Second Ward, or Blood Field and Bloody Hill in the Fifth Ward, not to mention Foggy Bottom and Swamp Poodle, First and Fourth Wards, all allude to Washington's lawlessness and disorder. The crime and prostitution that once infested Murder Bay's brothels and gambling dens has long since disappeared under the federal triangle development of government and commercial buildings of the 1920s and 30s. But its name, and the inglorious reputation established by the criminal underclass that once walked its streets, lives on. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, Please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. During the American Civil War, General Joseph Hooker's Army of the Potomac were camped in Washington, and so many prostitutes took up residence in the block south of Pennsylvania Avenue and east of the White House that the notoriously seedy slum became known as Hooker's Division. Popular legend tells that Hooker, as a slang term for a prostitute, derives from his last name because of parties and a lack of military discipline at his headquarters near the Murder Bay district. Some claim that the band of prostitutes that followed his division was derisively referred to as General Hooker's Army or Hooker's Brigade. It makes a compelling story. However, the term Hooker was used in print as early as 1845, years before Hooker was a public figure. The brothels were so expensive that one of its thoroughfares was known as Marble Alley, despite the fact that most buildings lining Pennsylvania Avenue, which was no more than a dirt road at the time, were humble wooden and brick structures. What attracted people to live in such filth and lawlessness? The city's population doubled after the Civil War with discharged soldiers, enfranchised slaves, and followers. Infrastructure failed to keep pace. Many African Americans who had been hired to build fortifications during the conflict found themselves looking for a place to live in a city experiencing a housing crisis. They established camps north of the White House and along the Washington City Canal and were joined by more groups of marginalized and impoverished people, many of the female camp followers having come from the north. The structures they erected were of the rudest character, barrel staves. Boxes and odd boards were crudely nailed together and sheets of discarded tin, pieces of old oil cloth and carpet constituted roofing. They were erected without reference to building regulations, street lines or the four-foot rule, though a rough road dirtway was left along the north bank of the horrendous smelling canal, which was just a few blocks south and constantly tormented people. Originally built for commerce, by the time of the Civil War the canal had been abandoned, becoming little more than an open sewer, into which anything from general waste to dead animals were thrown in. The constant arrival of refugees meant there wasn't enough land remaining to build more shanties. Then latecomers conceived the idea of putting a second story on the miserable dwellings, and in some instances a third story was added. All of these people likely stranger to one another until they became tenants on the same piece of land. Sometimes the upper stories could only be reached by outside staircases, at best, or ladders, at worst. It was the most disorderly aggregation of dwellings possible to conceive. Fires were also frequent, but the place so teemed with people at all hours of the day and night that the flames never got a fair chance of wiping out the place. General Hooker eventually confined all the hell of this slum into a few blocks of the city in an attempt to control the spread of vice and crime which not only consolidated its seedy activities, but magnified its reputation as a slum. Murders, stabbings, and fighting were common. The etymology of Murder Bay as a name, though its origin is unknown, holds no real mystery given its grim history, and may even have been coined by the police.
An account from the Washington Post newspaper in 1888 indicates how the area lived up to its name during the time of the Civil War. One of the first murders about this time that brought attention to Murder Bay was that of a man named Rideout. No one knew how it occurred, nor did the efforts of the police result in finding a single clue to his murderer. Then began a series of crimes which continued for the next four or five years. Men were known to go into Murder Bay and were not heard of again until their bodies were discovered in the canal or found buried in ash dumps. Robberies of the most daring nature happened in rapid succession. Men were carried from the streets into this locality and stripped of whatever they possessed. Lucky, indeed, if they escaped with their lives. Scarcely a week went by without some bloody ghastly corpse, crushed with a club, stuck or stabbed by a knife or pierced by a bullet, was not pulled out of the place. To fish the body of a murdered man or woman out of the canal was an event so common that it evoked very little comment. In 1861, policemen were not uniformed, but were armed with long harpoon-like spears, which had been the property of the Auxiliary Guards of Washington. In 1862, the men were furnished with locust clubs, about the size of a league baseball bat, and were authorized to carry pistols, which they had to provide themselves. Large number of arrests were made and the suspects sent to jail, but very few executions are recorded, and the explanation of this as given by a veteran policeman is that men were so much in request in the army that if a man suspected of murder and locked up in jail would agree to join the army, somehow or other his release would be effected. During the war, and for about two years after, it had passed into history. Murder Bay held the record for good cases, as heinous cases are termed in police English, and bore relation to the Washington of that period that Bloodfield, Lausalle, and Willow Tree Court did to the later 1800s, when raiding squads were working the 4th Precinct. Despite a Murder Bay police beat, it is likely that hundreds of murders were committed and remained undiscovered. In the late 1800s, you could have entered any police station where there was a lull and mentioned that business is a little slack since Murder Bay ceased to be. This would have started a flow of conversation as few things will, and an old veteran scarred by conflict with time and evil doers would unfold a tale for nothing will touch his memory so deeply and stir his reminiscence into action so well as the mention of Murder Bay. The police accounts that follow illustrate the terrible crimes that were commonplace. Two police roundsmen, Voss and House, saw a body lying in a byway one morning, the earth around it soaked in blood. It was a soldier of the Pennsylvania Regiment. His throat cut and deep slashes were found across his abdomen and breast, the knife had been plunged into his face with such strength that it had gone through the bone and not withdrawn. A trail of blood led away from the corpse, which the policemen followed. The trail led to a little shanty on the edge of the canal, and following it through the door the men came upon a woman who, as they entered, rolled on her side, gasped, and died. She had been horribly cut about the face, neck, and breast. One evening, the same men were present on the bank of the canal when the trunk of a girl was fished out. The head, arms, and legs, which had evidently been amputated with an axe, were brought up a little later. No clue to the murderer was ever obtained. Another story relates to a Maria Souter, who had come from a plantation near Fredericksburg and became involved in a row with two young girls who lodged with her. She brained the elder of the girls with a hatchet, binding the arms and legs of the younger with rope, and proceeded to torture her with a red-hot poker. Some of the people living in the adjacent shanty avenged the poor girls by chopping Souter to pieces. If murder found little consequence here, then fights were so common in Murder Bay that no attention was paid to them at all. Once there was a fight in the Bull's Head near Murder Bay, in which several soldiers were killed. An unknown commentator of the time describes Hooker's division with both a map and harsh words, presumably in an attempt to shame the ignorance of respectable Washingtonians to what was going on. The territory is in Washington, D.C., and is known as Hooker's Division. During the Civil War, it was occupied by the camp of General Joe Hooker's troops in their defense of Washington. Since then, it has become the plague spot of Washington, a center of vice, liquor selling, and prostitution, such is the characteristic of all high-licensed cities. It is in the very heart of the city, extending along Pennsylvania Avenue to the United States Treasury. The four daily papers of the city, The Post, Star, Times, and News, 
are published in this territory. Within its borders are the leading banks, opera houses, and hotels. This district alone contains 109 regular houses of prostitution, exclusive of assignation houses, 31 of which are in the single block surrounded by C, D, 13th, and 13th and a half streets northwest. Besides this, there are an even 50 saloons, most of them run directly in connection with bawdy houses. Each of these 109 houses of prostitution sells liquors openly and freely every day, and not a single one pays the $400 local license. There are 61 bawdy houses in the district which hold federal permits, while the other 48 pay no license whatsoever. They not only defy every provision of the high license law, but they refuse to pay the government license as well. Grover Cleveland can sit in his bedroom window at the White House and survey this entire territory. He is within sight and gunshot of each of these 109 dens which he is supposed to execute through his commissioners. Change was slow. Even in the early 1900s, a sanitary inspector was of the view that the citizens of the national capital neither knew nor were concerned with its civic ills, saying... Instead, the majority of Washington's resourceful people have been like the ostrich which imagines that nothing can be amiss if only its eyes are shrouded beneath the sand. Public-spirited citizens who have explained local needs and advocated remedial action have been met with a good deal of indifference and some condemnation. Our lawmakers in Congress have been so unconcerned that it took almost ten years to secure the passage. In 1906, of the elementary law for the compulsory repair or condemnation of insanitary dwellings, to put a picture in your mind of the appalling conditions of the Triangle of Filth in Murder Bay, we need look no further than East Capitol and A Streets, just behind the Congressional Chambers of the United States Capitol. This quarter of the city was, at the turn of the 20th century, a forgotten district, with the expected real estate speculation having turned instead northwest from the capital to build substantial houses. Here, brick and frame houses endured, with no water supply and no sewer connections, outhouses being primitive wooden boxes shared by many, refuse and filth built up on all sides. Many residents had to carry their water supply in buckets from a solitary hydrant. Foggy Bottom, the district, the other side of the Murder Bay Triangle and the White House was equally deplorable, and the only place named from the past that has survived Miasmic vapours that rose from the swamp at night was probably the original reason for such an unusual name, and later from the smog of the gasworks, factories, and odours from breweries. Here, people lived in old shacks unfit for human habitation, overlooking dump heaps. Their homes, being constructed from rusty scrap iron, and old boards gathered from the mounds of waste, from which their neighbours also scoured the muck for decaying vegetables and fruit to eat. Like the coming and going of the tides, tough districts rise and fall, a community settles and crime moves on. A policeman of the 1890s described how Tin Cup Alley, near four and a half street below the mall, rose up in the late 1860s as Murder Bay died out, where shooting and killing were continuous. Other places followed in quick succession. The Sand Lots and Jackson Alley, near the government printing office, and then Hell's Bottom, near Iowa Circle on Q&R Streets. Foggy Bottom and Bluefield then became the home of footpads and sneak thieves before, eventually, the police improved as the city grew and closed out these holes. Through the 1920s and 30s, urban renewal, including the ambitious Macmillan Plan, consigned the slums to history.